Good morning. Good morning. Hey, um, I would like for us to say um, thank you to the band, the CIY staff, the event staff, the production people that you don't see worshiping God backstage and behind the booth back there. Could we all just give a big round of applause to all the people that um, are making this incredible event happen for us? Uh, sincerely, um, thank you, and thank you to each of you. This has been a great, uh, great week for me. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. Um, so I want to, I want to share a secret with you. Uh, not that kind of secret. This is some uh, top secret, uh, propri proprietary knowledge type stuff. Um, I want to share with you the secret cure to nervousness. Um, call, it, call it the antidote to the poison of anxiety and fear, which may be one of the universal human experiences. I mean, there's a, a room this size, there's a few of you that are experiencing some social anxiety right now just by being around a lot of people. And every single one of us feel nervous sometime, somewhere, or will in the future. I mean, anxiety, fear, nervousness is just a regular part of life. Maybe um, some of you are feeling that way coming into this last day of the week, thinking about the mess you have to go home to, or um, the, the drama that was unresolved, or um, whatever, bad family situation, etc. cetera. Um, maybe it'll come in the fall when you go to a brand new school, or a brand new classroom, or um, get new teachers, and um, you've got to figure out how you're going to fit into this thing. Maybe you're actually going away from home for the first time. Maybe the anxiety will come that moment when you finally get your shot. The ball's in your hand or the spotlight is on you, and now, what are you going to do with it? Um, it comes to everybody the first time you sit across that interview table for your first, like, real job, and you hope that you get it. You hope that you do a good job. I mean, just feeling anxious. Your hands start to get a little numb, fingers get a little uh, tingly, maybe tremble a little bit, your mouth gets dry, your throat gets dry, you might hear your pulse rising in your ears, you feel that in your stomach like you're on a roller coaster, I mean that feeling of anxiety, nervousness, fear, it's something that we all have to deal with, uh, but there is a secret cure. Um, something I've been using I didn't make it up, I learned it. It's something I've been using for years now, especially every time I do something like this. Um, I get the chance to do this sort of thing from time to time to get in front of groups of people um, at conferences like this or sometimes at churches, some, at my home church sometimes. Um, and, but then also when I teach, I teach you know, fifth graders math in the inner city and whenever I get in front of a classroom and whether it's my new group of fifth graders this coming fall or getting up in front of you guys this morning or any other sort of version of that, it's pretty normal for me to get a little rush of anxiety. It's pretty normal for me to feel a little bit uh, nervous about that. What if I mess up? But there's a cure. There is an antidote for nervousness. Here it is. The antidote for nervousness is concern for your audience or concern for others. Now, I did not make that up. I heard it first from a pastor called, uh, named Andy Stanley in Atlanta. Maybe some of you have heard of him. I don't know if he made it up. He may have passed it along from somewhere else. But the, the cure, the antidote is, before I get up on stage and I start to feel a little bit nervous, I stop and I think about you. I, I become concerned for you. And I start to think true things. Like, okay, in, in, a, in a group this size, there's, there's some people out there, there's some young men and some young women who are, they're hurting right now, literally physically in pain. In a room this size, there's somebody that is, is sick, there's somebody that has some kind of injury and, and emotional pain, there's people struggling with, with fear and doubt and insecurity and, and, and they need some comfort, you need some, some encouragement. And some of you that are heartbroken, I know it's true. In a room this size, there's, there's, there's some of you that would just give anything if you could just talk to him one more time or see her one more time. And I start to think about these things, and I start to become concerned for you, and this desire wells in me 
to give you something, to help you with something, to lift you up in, in some way. I think about the fact that some of you know you're going back to something dysfunctional or maybe you're even scared to face him. But some of you made big decisions this week and um, when you get back home, uh, you're gonna need some courage to actually do the thing that you decided to do. Some of you are going off to new places next year and you need, or you've got big decisions to make when you get home and you need wisdom. You're going through some things. And I think about these things and I start to become concerned for you and it's almost like magic. If I begin to get concerned for you, all of my anxiety just sort of evaporates. I want you to try this. When you go to your new school in the fall or when you, God opens up some opportunity for you to share your faith with somebody or invite somebody along to some ministry thing or whatever, and you start to feel that anxiety, what if I don't have the right thing to say? What if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? You start to feel that fear. Or when you get your moment or that job interview or whenever it is, I want you to try it. Try out concern for others. Try thinking, what does this woman across the interview table What's she going through right now? What does she need? What, what kind of employee would help her do her thing that she's trying to accomplish? Become concerned for others, and the anxiety just sort of evaporates. Because what is anxiety? What is it, what's happening when I'm nervous? Well, I'll just speak for myself. When I'm nervous, before I get up here, I'm thinking, Whoa, I hope I don't mess up. I mean, I hope I don't like trip over a wire and fall on my face, or um, I hope I don't fall off the stage. Um, I hope I don't say something stupid. I hope something doesn't slip out. Gosh, I hope I don't say a swear word. Can you imagine? <laughs> I, hope, I hope I don't find myself babbling about something that doesn't make sense, like, um, you know, don't let the devil take your chocolate cake or something like that, you know? Uh, <laughs> I hope I'm amazing. I hope I remember everything I plan to say. I hope they think I'm awesome. I hope they think this material is incredible. I hope I do a great job. I, 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 me, me, me. And the moment I make my brain turn the corner and think about you and what you're going through and what you're feeling and what you're struggling with, it's almost as if there isn't enough room in my brain to be concerned for you and focused on myself at the same time. It's, it's like, it's like this, ain't town, this town isn't big enough for both of us. Like, I, I can either be thinking about you, concerned for you, or I can be concerned for myself. And anxiety flows almost entirely out of self-concern. Um, so concern for others, concern for your audience is the antidote, the cure, for anxiety, fear, and nervousness. But I think that actually the way that John says it is even better. He doesn't say concern for your audience. He says love. He says love drives out fear. Love expels fear. God's love has the power to make us fearless. Here's where he wrote that. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16 through 19. God is love, he says, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, as we live in love and live in God, our love grows more perfect. So, we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in the world. Such love, that kind of love, that kind of love that is lived in love and gradually become more perfect, that kind of love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. Perfect love drives out all fear. There isn't room in our hearts for love and fear. As the love grows, it's like the light growing. It pushes out the fear, it pushes out the darkness. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. Whether it's punishment in the next life or something going wrong in this life. And this shows that we have not fully experienced 
his perfect love. It doesn't mean that he doesn't love you perfectly. It means we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We love each other because he loved us first. God's love drives out fear. I mean, the things that there are to fear in life are, you know, things in this life and things in the next life. And when you become a believer, many of you made this decision today, you're already starting to feel like, wow, I don't have, I don't have to fear death. You're already starting to get it in your mind. There's nothing to be afraid of on the other side because Jesus has taken care of that. And the more you walk with him and the more you experience, experience the truth that he is always with you and he never leaves you and he never forsakes you, that even when you go through difficult and scary and painful experiences, he always gives you what you need. He's always there behind the scenes. He always gives you the wisdom or the strength or the courage you need. It always works out even when it's horrible. He's always there with you. The more you experience that, your fear about the things that can happen to you in this life gradually dissipates. But what I have noticed is that many people don't experience that perfect love that drives out fear. And I think what happens is it kind of gets bottled up. A lot of people think a lot about the love that God has for us, and it's a worthy thought because they're is nothing better. But that love that God has for us, that he proved for us by coming in person and dying and living the perfect life and coming back to life all on our behalf when we didn't deserve it, that love gets kind of stuck because it never flows back out. And it was designed not just to come to us, but also to flow back out. And you don't really experience the love, the perfect and perfecting love that will push away fear until you begin to let it sort of flow out of you and love others. So the question today, as we head into the rest of this day, and then as you head back into your lives is, who has God called you to love? And it'd be good if there was a name. Who is it? Maybe it's somebody close, close but not close. You know, maybe it's your dad. Just trying to keep it real. Um, maybe it's that bully at school. Or maybe it's the kid that always sits alone. Maybe it's that crotchety old math teacher. We appreciate it. Uh, maybe it's that, uh, that dude on the basketball team you just can't stand, showboater. Who is it? Maybe it's that person that's down, out, lonely, that person that's kind of awkward that you're tempted to avoid. Who is it that God is calling you to love in the same way that Jesus loved you? Not because you're gonna get anything out of it, not because they can increase your standing or your following or likes or retweets or whatever. Not because you can get anything out of it, but to love them the way that Jesus loved you. Who is God calling you to love? Because love is a powerful thing. And if you start to do that, God's love flows through you. You experience that perfect kind of love and it, it drives out all fear. It drives out self-concern. Self it drives out uh, nervousness and anxiety. And this is a perspective change that you can have instantly. It's a powerful thing, love. It's powerful. People do not rush into burning buildings to face their fear of fire. They do it to save others. They do it for love. Uh, from the little, uh, the conversations I've had with soldiers who have been in live fire and books that I've read, uh, men and women do not step out from cover into live fire to face their fear of attack. No, they do it for, for uh, duty, responsibility, and love towards the men and women besides them and the people that they have back home. They do it for love. Love has the power to prompt you to face a bullet, to walk into fire. Love is a powerful thing. Fear against love, fear is nothing. And this is a perspective that you can change like that. There are not many things in life that, that are like that. I'll be honest with you. Most things in life take time. Most things that are worth having in life take time. This is something you can change your mind about instantly. 
And we kind of have a visual in the room that, that brings that point home. You see these, these kind of pillar sign things with these letters on them. If you look at the, the white letters on the black background, you see the word fear. But if you kind of switch your perspective a little bit and you look at the black letters on the white background, you see the word love. And it's kind of hard to see them both at the same time. It makes a nonsensical word. And th that's kind of what this is like. You have the choice about where you're gonna place your attention. And if you decide to love, fear kind of fades. If you give way to fear, it's because you've decided not to love. You guys wanna know another secret? Yeah? When you love other people the way Jesus loved you, it's like you're loving him. That's what he said anyway. He said, you know, if you, if you feed somebody who's hungry, it's like you fed me. If you uh, give a cup of water to somebody who's thirsty, even the least little one, it's like you did it for me. If you visit somebody who's lonely or in prison, it's like you did it for me. When you love somebody else the way that I've loved you, it's like you did it for me. There's a, um, I want to tell you about one of my students, this boy um, named, I'm going to call him Henry. Uh, my school is almost entirely um, Hispanic students, mostly from the Dominican Republic, but we do have a handful of African American students, and Henry is one of the, one of the African American students. Um, he's also uh, on the autism spectrum. Very high functioning, but he's got some kind of classic, um, Classic ways that his brain works, being on the autis autism spectrum, which I am by no means an expert in, but I'm learning. And, uh, um, well, first off, let me just say, I love this kid. <laughs> this, this kid is like one of the brightest parts of my day. So like one example of something Henry does is he, he always greets me. He always says, good morning, Mr. Travis. He always says, I'll see you at, like if he leaves first period, I'll see you third period, Mr. Travis, or I'll see you at lunch, or I'll see you when you pick us up from gym. He always knows his, ske his schedule. And on Fridays, he always says, have a great weekend. And as the year progressed, he started saying it earlier and earlier in the day and more and more times. So it got to where like, he would say that four or five times to me, like, have a great weekend, Mr. Travis. And I'd be like, thank you, Henry. You have a great weekend. And then it got to where like, he started saying it to me first thing Friday morning. He would come in and be like, have a great weekend, Mr. Travis. And I was like, okay, Henry, I got to call it. We are not allowed to do this till after lunch. Um, okay, we're not allowed to do this until people are allowed to drink, all right? That's when we're allowed to start doing this. So, um, so afternoon, then we can start doing that. Have a great weekend, Mr. Travis. I love this kid. But some of the things that he faces is um, sort of classic um, on the spectrum type stuff. He, um, he has a very hard time interpreting emotions and making sense of them. And so he misreads situations a lot. Like, uh, um, he's got some really good buddies. We got some of the other students to just like adopt him and they did, like champs. He is like in their, in their clique, in their gang. But they, these other boys, they really like to horse around and play fight and stuff like that. And Henry really does not like physical, any kind of physical violence. And he can't read that they're playing. He thinks that they're really fighting and it really distresses him, and he tries to break it up. And the other boys are getting frustrated with Henry because Henry gets really loud and tries to break them up. And so I met with them, and I explained to them what's going on, and I tried to help those boys understand, like, look, in Henry's mind, you are, you're killing each other. You're fighting each other, and he has come to your rescue. Gosh, I wish I had a friend like that, and help them try to get where he's coming from, and then tried to help Henry understand you're having a hard time reading that they're just playing. They're just trying to have a good time. So I asked them to come up with a code word, and they picked SpongeBob. I don't know what. And the code word is, this isn't real, Henry. We're just playing. And uh, it worked. He, they were like, I don't even know what I'm doing. But it worked. They will be play fighting, and Henry starts getting all hyped. And, and they'd be like, oh, no, SpongeBob, Henry. And he's like, oh, OK, OK. He still doesn't like it, but he, he knows the, the code word. Now, Henry does not have a violent bone in his body. He's, like, he's a big kid, but he's like the gentlest, the gentlest boy that you've ever met. But when he gets distressed, another thing, and this is a spectrum thing, he also can't really modulate his own emotions. He has a hard time figuring out how serious is this issue. So like a broken pencil can, can turn into like full out Hulk mode. 
you know, tears, not bubbles, rage mode. Um, so that, like, that's, that's another thing that happens, and he also has like some personal space issues. He doesn't read, he doesn't get body language and personal space, so he is often right up on me. Maybe even sometimes like in the middle of class. Well, I'll be teaching, and suddenly Henry needs something, and he is right up on me. And I'm just like, oh, hey. <laughs> Having a good day, Henry? And, and he you know, says, I'm like, all right, okay, buddy. All right, <laughs> all right, buddy. So all that so that you can understand this story. I spend a lot of my day talking Henry off ledges because he, he misinterprets things and gets super, super upset. So it was one of those crazy days. I'm rushing out of the building to get some food for lunch, and I don't have a lot of time. And any teachers in the room, you know how that can go sometimes. And they take our kids to a, a park that's about a block away from the school for recess, and I just passed a bunch of my students on the way out of the building, and then I get outside, and Henry is on the sidewalk with a teacher standing about 10 feet away, and he is in full out rage Hulk mode. And I'll be completely honest with you, I was like, I'm hungry, and I do this all the time, so my first impulse was to just kind of like, you know, and get by there. But the thing is, I genuinely like this kid. I, I genuinely love this kid. And it was going to be a mess. I mean, he was dripping with sweat from running around in recess. And I mean, I, when I first saw his face, I thought someone had pegged him with a water balloon because his face was just glistening with tears and snot and saliva because he was just ah, he's so mad about this thing. Look, let me tell you all, um, there's so much bacteria when you're a teacher. I am sick every day. They, they give me summers off just so that I won't die. <laughs> so there's a strong temptation to bustle by this circumstance, um, but I, love, I, like, I genuinely like this kid and I hate to see him so distraught. I, so I, I pull up and um, this other teacher didn't know him and I was like, let me try to talk to him for a minute. It took a while to get him, kind of calmed down. I finally got out what was going on and he was raging because some other kid at recess, he overheard another kid at recess. We'll call this kid Francis G from class 503. <laughs> not true. He might have been from 503, but not true. Not the kid's name. But for, he overheard Francis G from 503 say, Christmas is not real. I don't know if he said Santa is not real or Christmas, but Henry was saying Christmas is not real. And he was raging. <gasps> it's my favorite holiday. <gasps> and I'm not going to get my presents. And he said Christmas is not real. He's raging about this. So I know I needed to like adjust, I need to break this thought process. And I was like, whoa, 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 Henry, wait, wait, wait. Christmas is as real as it gets. Now, if we're talking about Santa, <laughs> here's what you need to know about Santa. He's black. Uh, all of the, all, that's why you hardly ever see him. That's the real one. Every mall in America has a fake imposter white Santa Claus, but if you want to see the real Santa Claus, you got to go to Harlem. That's what needs to happen. I'm just putting you on notice, friends. I didn't, all right, I didn't say that last part. That's what I say in my mind to entertain myself. Um, here's what I really did say to Henry. I really did say, um, does your mother listen to Francis G from 503? And he was like, no, no, she does not. I don't think, do you think, Henry, that your mother is going to say, well, we were going to have Christmas, but Francis G from 503 said Christmas isn't real, so now we're not. No, no, she will not. Is your mother going to say, you know, I bought all these presents, but Francis G from 503 says Christmas isn't real, so I'm just going to have to take all these presents back. No, she will not say that. Does Francis G from 503 have powers? He does not have power. Can Francis G from 503 speak things into existence? No, he cannot. Well, buddy, pretty sure you're going to have Christmas. Okay. <laughs> Problem solved. I went and got myself a, a sandwich. Uh, 
Now, the point of that story, <laughs> you have to understand, these things happen every day. It's not a big thing. And that's the point of this story. There really was nothing special about that. There certainly was nothing special about helping a student or, I mean, in a way there is, but in a way, it's a very everyday thing for somebody to help a student or even to help an autistic student. Every day, thousands of caring adults help thousands of autistic kids. There's no miracle in what happened there, but there was a miracle happening there. And it's a miracle you wouldn't have really been able to see unless you had known me before. And this was the miracle. And if you'd known me before, you would have said, this is a miracle. This was the miracle. I was enjoying myself. Love is powerful. Love can drive out fear and any other negative things, not bubbles, sweat. Love can drive out fear and any other thing until the only thing that's left is love. Man, you feel grateful for what God has done for us in Jesus? You ever wish that there was something you could do to say thank you to him? Well, there is. There are not many things that I can say with authority that I know make God happy, but there's a couple. I know that he really enjoys the pleasure of your company. He, that's why he made you. Uh, but aside from that, the only thing I really know that really makes God happy is whenever we love somebody else the way that Jesus loves us. Love anybody else the way that Jesus loves you, and you have done it for him. I love you all. God bless you. In the name of the one who loved us first. Amen. Thank you.